Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to be here. Um, yes, I have been writing a new book, and uh, I've been, you know, the last seven or eight weeks um, doing 12 hours a day. Um, but um, fortunately, I'm just a young kid having fun, so it's not been a problem. So I'm going to talk about, of course, games, um, how they go beyond entertainment, how we can use games to not just inform, but to help our children learn because of the engagement they get from the enjoyment and the pleasure and the learning from games. So, um, when we enter this world as babies, we interact with that world with our own curiosity makes us want to find out what's happening and through that interaction we learn quite a lot. And when we get older, we enjoy solving puzzles. We, love, you know, we are problem-solving animals, naturally. No one has to teach us how to problem-solve. And when we get older and we attach rules to those puzzles, they become games. Um, I joined the games industry not long after chess was invented in 647. Um, started the company with two old school friends, uh, Steve Jackson, this side, John Peake, and the really handsome guy on that side, that's me. And uh, we were avid games players, and we wanted to turn our hobby of playing games into a, a business of, of making them. And so we started this company called Games Workshop back in 1975, before any of you were born. Um, we reached out to the games community as was then through a newsletter which we'd put together called Owl and Weasel. As you can see, this full color glossy magazine uh, on, on display here. And um, although we hadn't sent the magazine directly to him, one copy of it found its way onto the desk of this gentleman. His name is Gary Gygax, who lived in, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And uh, he wrote to us and said, love your magazine. Um, great what you're doing, trying to get a games community going. Um, please find and close this game I've just invented. It's called Dungeons and Dragons. And um, we looked at this funny white box with this strange little amateurish drawing on the front and thought, wonder what's inside here. Opened it up, three rule booklets, no game board, no sort of dice or anything. And we figured it out and designed a dungeon a uh, labyrinth of rooms and passageways, and realized about the role-playing aspect. He took on the roles of heroes and wizards and clerics and go on these fantastical journeys of the mind. And it really was kind of a transform, transformational moment for Steve and I in particular. And we became completely obsessed with Dungeons and Dragons. Here was a game that had been the like of which had never seen before and probably never see again. And it was the most, for my mind, the most influential game that ever to have been, been released. Um, because it opened up your imagination like no other. And so we ordered six copies of Dungeons and Dragons on the back of that huge order, because that's all the money we had in the world. Um, we were given the, an exclusive three-year distribution agreement for the whole of Europe, um, because Gary Gygax was also operating out of a flat in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So we zoomed over to the States to go to Gen Con, um, and where we met all the fledgling games companies, uh, and then in this particular slide, got Fritz Lieber, a science fiction author, next to him is Gary Gygax, uh, Professor Barker, who invented Empire of the Petal Throne, myself holding the boxes, uh, Rob Kuntz, who did a lot of the D&D &D, um, uh, rules writing, and, and Steve smirking at the front. Um, we also got to meet Miss Wisconsin 1976, uh, I don't know what she's doing, but I'm here today in Coventry having a nice time. Um, <laughs> and we came back full of excitement, um, wanted to you know, pack in our rubbish jobs because we were doing this kind of part-time, go to the bank manager and said, we've got this great game. It's a game which you're a hero, a wizard, and you kill monsters and find treasure, and it's a role-playing game. And he looked at you a bit like a, a dog watching television. Uh, <laughs> No idea what we were talking about and kind of ushered us out the door. And um, we'd been selling D&D uh, &D through, uh, through our apartment, which was a third floor apartment in Shevers Bush. And uh, there was, we didn't have a phone back there. Um, we had, um, uh, clearly there was no mobile phones. We didn't have a phone in our, in our flat. But there was a public pay phone on the ground floor, um, which was usually uh, answered by our landlord, Paddy. Uh, and on a Friday, he had a few drinks, and the phone would ring, um, zoom down the stairs, always too late, Paddy was there first. And it was always going to be a, a telephone order for Dungeons & Dragons, and he'd say, hello. Uh, you want workshop, games workshop, do you? 
mm -hmm. you can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd hang up. And uh, we valued the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the real power of uh, public relations right there and um, realized that we had a bit of a problem. Anyway, Paddy showed us the door eventually. He tired of all these parcels and people arriving and because uh, he used to see people milling around on the street outside looking for this shop of course there wasn't one um, so we had to make a decision whether to have somewhere to live or, or somewhere to to rent the flat because we didn't have any any cash so we ended up living uh, in a van similar to this van morrison for three months and um because we had to rent our little office which was in shepherd's bush and it is about the size of a bread bin but uh, when I say to people in starting off their businesses, this shouldn't be seen as a hardship. It's part of, if you're really passionate about doing something, it's all part of the journey. And even though it was miserable in that stinking van in the winter, it was also fun at the same time because we were you know, passionate about what, we were about what we were doing. We were determining our own destiny. You know, we were kind of living the dream. And uh, it was really exciting times. And um, we opened our very first shop in 1978 in Hammersmith in West London because um, we'd had trouble getting other shops to stock Dungeons & Dragons. Um, they couldn't get their head around. It was a designer game kit more than a board game in itself. They needed all these peripherals with figures and magazines and stuff that they couldn't, couldn't handle. So we opened our first shop in 1978. Here it is. I doubt if any of you were in, the, in that queue, but if you were, please let me know. I found two people so far. We are intending to do a kind of reunion sort of Abbey Road <laughs> shot, um, but problem being these days is the Bosnia and Herzegovina <laughs> Community <laughs> Advice Center, so that could be a little bit challenging, but I'm sure Photoshop can help us out. Uh, there are even rumors that it's going to be demolished soon, so we, know we have to uh, act very quickly. Of course, uh, workshop's doing pretty well now. Uh, Steve and I are no longer involved with the company. Um, we sold out in the 90s. Uh, it's now a publicly uh, listed company, 300 stores, everything focused on, 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 on Warhammer. And this is another thing I say to students when they're starting off about thinking about their own business, uh, is that they should own their inter own intellectual property. When we launched Dungeons & Dragons, we had a three-year exclusive distribution agreement, at the end of which Gary Gygax said, we want to uh, merge TSR, his company, with Games Workshop. Now, we were young independent Brits and we said no to that uh, merger opportunity. And so we lost the exclusivity on Dungeons & Dragons which left us with a problem. And that's really how Warhammer came about, uh, to fill that void um, of, of exclusivity. So Rick Priestley, Richard Halliwell and Brian Ansell set about um, designing Warhammer. And that's what the whole value really of, of Workshop is all about. Is, is not just the publishing revenues from Warhammer, but also the incremental revenues from licensing and merchandising around the intellectual property. And I'll talk about more about IP later on, but you determine your own destiny if you own your own IP, and also you get increased much more value in your company because you've got IP ownership as opposed to acting as a service for somebody else. Um, D&D was amazing. Warhammer, fantastic, of course, but we wanted to take the essence of role-playing and try and take it to a wider audience. And we used to run these events called uh, Games Day at Workshop. Um, 5,000 people in, hall, in a hall in the middle of London playing Dungeons and & Dragons. And we invited other companies to have stands at, at, at Games Day, one of which was Penguin Books. And their editor, Geraldine Cook, was fascinated by the enthusiasm that people displayed in playing Dungeons & Dragons. At the end of the games day, she came to Steve and I and said, would you like to write a book about the role-playing hobby? And Steve and I said, well, rather than writing a book about the hobby, why can't we write a book that effectively is the hobby, an interactive book? And she looked a bit confused by that uh, suggestion, but said to her credit, well, send us a proposal. So we sent in uh, an idea for a book which we called The Magic Quest at that point. And one year later, fast forward, despite the managing director of Penguin Books laughing at the idea, um, The Warlock of Fire Top Mountain came out in 1982, August. And as was said in the introduction, it's the 35th anniversary of this year. So these books were, were different. These were books in which you are the hero. It gave power to the reader. 
they made the choices. They decided which way to travel through these books. It wasn't a linear narrative where you may or may not relate to the character. These were interactive books, branching narrative with a game system attached to them. So at the end of each paragraph, you had to make a choice simplistically, whether you turn left or turn right, whether you attacked the little old man or you just talked to him. Um, and I used to enjoy, of course, <laughs> writing these paragraphs that lured the reader to their ultimate doom as they fell on poison spikes. That was, gave me a lot of gratification. <laughs> but um, <coughs> children had their imaginations fired up by this um, because uh, it was though they were actually on these journeys and each one would be different and they would relate their journeys and their adventures to their friends. And it spread, it spread like wildfire on the playgrounds of the day. The virality at that point was the power of the playground. So the word nice to see that the invention of gamification was here because uh, you know, we were told that fighting fantasy was effectively the gamification of literature. Um, we also relied heavily on the art. Um, this was Death Trap Dungeon. They, they were published in over 30 languages and we usually managed to get the foreign publishers to use the, the artists that we used because originally when Penguin Books signed up the books, they said, we've got our house artists which we'd like to use. And um, we said, well, what kind of covers do you want to put on them? So they said, well, we'd like to have, you know, a toadstool with a little gnome on it and <laughs> some butterflies in the, in the background. And we said, I'm sorry, but we want covers that kind of threaten to rip the faces off the readers. <laughs> um, so can we use some of our Games Workshop artists? But we won that battle. And, um, you know, the art of some of the books has been quite amazing. People like Ian McCaig, who went on to create Darth Maul for George Lucas and others. It gave them a real sort of blank canvas to really express themselves because as you know as children you don't really get scared by these things you enjoy it so we did convince all the publishers overseas to use our covers occasionally the odd territory would say we know our market better than you do so we said okay so here's a Japanese cover of uh, Death Trap Dungeon <laughs> I can't make any comment about it you have to make your own mind about it Clearly, they know their market better than I do, but it does quite clearly say Death Trap Dungeon. <laughs> so 18 million copies sold. Um, you'd think that was a great thing, you know, children reading again, big plus. Um, but no. Um, the Evangelical Alliance published an eight-page warning guide about the book saying, because you're interacting with ghouls and demons, you're obviously going to get possessed by the devil. Um, a worried housewife in deepest suburbia phoned in her local radio station and said that having read one of my books, her son levitated. <laughs> so the kids are thinking, one pound fifty, I can fly, we'll have some of that. <laughs> and the local vicar threatened to chain himself to uh, the, the front gates of Penguin Books until they were um, Banned. Of course, we'd like to thank them all for this, that wonderful publicity that they gave us uh, because they really made up for the lack of uh, advertising that Penguin did for the books, so uh, that was good. But it went to extreme levels. Um, magazine articles warning that reading our books, children actually participate through their imaginations. Can you imagine that, using your imagination? <laughs> what a shocking thing happened back in the day. And there was a petition sent into Penguin Books. All these parents, we have their addresses. <laughs> Um, wanting the books banned because they thought they were dangerous and harmful because of they were actually pain, you know, transfixed as they were reading them. You know, they're actually enjoying that reading, which is obviously shocking as well. Um, but history has never been kind to games. Um, back in the 1800s, Scientific American wrote rather terrible things about chess, saying that people should do much nobler things with their minds than, than, than waste their time playing chess. And when it comes to video games, of course, the media goes into a sort of apoplectic frenzy when talking about games uh, being the downfall of, of Western society, basically. And Grand Theft Auto V, a uh, great British success story, developed in, in Scotland, generated over a billion dollars in three days. Um, it is 18 rated, by the way, so children shouldn't be playing this game. But however, it's a great British success story, culturally and economically important. And... Um, Yes, it's, it's usually talked about in, 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 a, in a negative sense. So let's kind of go back a bit and talk about uh, where video games has come from. Well, um, 
there'd been a couple of attempts in laboratories to simulate uh, games like Space War, but they were never commercially uh, produced. It wasn't until Pong came out in 1972, the Atari Com Corporation, Nolan Bush and all that games really got some traction out, outside, of the, outside of the laboratory. And of clearly, Pong was not sold on its graphics. And when people say to me, what are the three most important things about a game? I will say, gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Technology and graphics play a supporting role in, in, in games. 